Hi, thank you for joining us today. I'm Carrie Stevens, the editor of 24-7 Magazine. Today I'm joined with two of the top movers and shakers in the HTM industry, Matt Baratek, president of Baratek Engineering Inc. and co-author of Computerized Maintenance Management Systems for Healthcare Technology Management, and Clarice Holden, chief biomedical engineer at VA North Texas Healthcare System. Thanks Matt and Clarice for being on this webinar. And my first question is just how is the COVID-19 pandemic affecting your work personally? Go ahead, Clarice. So, oh yeah, so Clarice, at the Clarice, VA North Texas Clarice, healthcare system. Clarice is on the front line, so she's the one I really wanna hear from. Right, so our, our life has kind of turned a little bit differently. The first thing our healthcare system did, which I think we've been very forward in our aggressive kind of coordination among our um, among our patients and our employees. So for, for three weeks now, we've actually cut down the number of entries into the hospital. So you can't come in through the back dock entrance, which is close to where the biomed shop is. So that, that makes the, the walk a little bit a little bit different. And the the number of entrances, there's only four now to the hospital and there were probably a dozen or more previously. So we're required to go in and get screened every morning, which involves us being asked, it used to be a series of questions, but now they've just broken it down to one. Are you experiencing any flu-like symptoms to include fever, shortness of breath? or uh, persistent and worsening cough. And after that, they check our temperature remotely. At first they had these little temporal thermometers where they'd come up and they'd, they'd check, scan your forehead to see if you had a fever. And then afterward you get these kind of really fashionable mm -hmm. VIP wristbands where you wear it around and that means you've been screened for that day. We have um, several hundred thousand of these little bracelets and they're all different colors. So we get a different color each day. So you're not, uh, you you know, obviously we're not reusing the bands, we're going and getting screened every single morning. And so that has pretty much been the, the biggest difference in just the start of the day. Um, and it turns out our, our patient loads are actually down because we're not doing any elective surgeries right now. We are basically holding off on anything that's not life-threatening when it comes to surgical procedures because we are working to preserve our PPE or personal protective equipment as much as possible because we, we really do need that for when we service our COVID-19 patients. And our, our hospital actually was, um, was, I guess, fortunate in that we didn't get um, a lot of cases as quickly as hospitals in New York, such as hospitals in New York and Louisiana and New Orleans. And we have basically, we, we mapped out a route for when, what was going to happen with the, the patients as they came in, if they were identified or if employees were identified as having a fever, which routes they would go. And we have several, uh, I guess, you know, routes that they take to go to either employee health or to the ED for further screening. And it's basically just everybody coming to this new normal of making sure that we're healthy when we come into work. And we're also following the CDC guidelines, which were published on April 3rd, to be wearing a mask when we're in the vicinity of another person, um, not just when we're, you know, even if we are social distancing, we're still encouraged to wear a mask just because, and mine's actually hanging on my on my computer screen, um, just to protect your own droplets from going anywhere because you can be, you know, transmitting the the disease if you're showing no symptoms. So it's important to kind of just protect others from yourself, which sounds a little, you know, maybe backward, but it, it really is important because I, I think it's something like 2.5 drops of spit every word or whatnot that you're, you know, putting out into the into the air. So it's important, even if you are, you know, six feet away to still have that mask. And that's why the CDC changed its guidelines and we're following that around the hospital. We're seeing less uh, less calls just because we're, we have less patients in the hospital because people are being encouraged to stay in place. Um, Texas and North Texas in particular has had a stay at home order extended now until April 30th. So um, actually it might even be May 20th. I should probably look into that. Um, but what a lot of us essential employees hear is, okay, traffic is going to be great for the next month. Um, but on the other hand, uh, a lot of folks are staying home. And so there's a lot less activity happening up in the medical center. So calls are less frequent. And um, 
we're trying to rearrange our work environment and workplaces a little bit. Our engineers and our networking biomedical equipment support specialists are on telework for a, a lot of the time. We're maintaining a minimum on-site coverage, but trying to get people to stay home as much as possible and shelter in place. And for our other staff members, so those in our, our imaging technicians and our critical care technicians, we're basically hoping or well working to rearrange their workplaces so that they've got at least six feet apart from the next bench, if you will, while they're here on site. Thanks. For me, in some respects, my day-to-day uh, -day work is, is uh, similar because I do a lot of work remotely anyway. Uh, so um, I'm a lot like many other people sort of dealing with it in on a personal and family. Uh, level. I'm so impressed by the frontline workers in HTM, Clarice and her group, and m many of the people who are on this, watching this video, and thanks to 24 by 7 for putting this together. Uh, what, what I have learned is that sharing information is so important and trying to get good information out so that we can learn from each other. I see lots of really good ideas. The character of my work has shifted a little. In, in So I'm in Northern Colorado. I do clinical engineering consulting. I do some forensic engineering for incident investigations. Uh, that sort of shifted. Now I'm just, I'm, I'm talking to a lot of different people, trying to, you know, encourage collaboration among different groups. I've been talking to uh, two different research groups, one at the University of Colorado Bioengineering Department. They're working on some uh, modeling for some of these new innovative ideas about uh, opening up ventilator resources, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. Also, with a group that's um, centered at Massachusetts General Hospital. Julian Goldman is a anesthesiologist and um, biomedical engineer there who's convened a group to share ideas. Uh, so I've been reading the same things that I think many of you have been reading about these innovative attempts to get more ventilator resources available if we need them. And the expectation is we will. We'll overwhelm the resources, in, certainly in some areas of the, the country. And so you're seeing, you know, uh, attempts to put two or four patients on a single ventilator. Uh, and their people are going forward with that. I sat in on a webinar from New York Presbyterian. They have been developed a clinical protocol for how to do that. Uh, I think they have not had to do much of it yet, but they um, are ready. And um, you see the other things out there, people repurposing, as Clarice was saying, uh, anesthesia ventilators and other kinds of breathing support apparatus, uh, people working on how you can use CPAP or BiPAP machines to support patients. Uh, and you can find plenty of designs for, I don't know if there's an official term, but I just call them ambu bag squeezers that uh, push on, on, the, on the, the balloon to keep uh, people going. And, and I, I've got to say, maybe you all are the same. Uh, those are appealing to me because, you know, I was the kid who wore out Tinker Toys and wore out Erector sets and built ham radios and, and constructed Heath kits and all that stuff. So I love that. And, and I encourage anybody who's doing that sort of thing. But I, what I'm finding in working with these research groups is those are not short-term solutions. I mean, we're in the height now of uh, the, the crunch time for COVID-19. And so those are great ideas and I would encourage people to keep pursuing them. They're not gonna get us out of this situation. Uh, what's gonna get us out is some of the social distancing and other things that, that Clarice was mm -hmm. talking about to keep, uh, you know, flatten the curve and keep the demand uh, down. So the, the work with the two, uh, with Mass General and with the University of Colorado what it's kind of morphed into is they're doing some digital and mathematical modeling of things like 
what if you try to put two or four patients on a ventilator? How do you set that ventilator up? How do you um, how do you monitor the patients? Uh, we're learning lots of things like COVID-19 patients can change dramatic physiologically, uh, dramatically in short periods of time. And so, you know, having two very different patients on one ventilator uh, can be a, a serious problem. So there's, there are monitoring issues. Uh, so that is doing um, modeling to try to see if you can, you can put something, you can anticipate them rather than just trying it. 3D printing something and hooking it up and hoping it works, which I, I'm not, uh, con, you know, um, critical of. I mean, you got to do what you've got to do. The longer term, maybe uh, putting some some science and engineering behind uh, some of those things. What we're finding is, um, for example, you you make a model and you want to test it. It's very difficult to find a good ventilator test equipment, lung test lungs, for example, that you can, you know, more than just a rubber bag that you can actually um, adjust parameters physiologically and see what happens for multiple patients. Um, they're just, those test resources are not available. I've tried begging and borrowing and, and uh, everything I can think of, but you can imagine with all of the work going on of uh, you know, Dyson and General Motors and Tesla and whoever else building ventilators, all that test equipment has gone into that kind of thing and into HTM departments to take care of, of your own ventilators. And so you, you run into problems. You say, I have a design that uh, I think we need some kind of a solenoid valve and it's a standard product. You can't buy it. They're, those are long gone. But what I have been impressed with is that uh, in some in some respects when you do this kind of um, you know create creative innovation sometimes what you do is uh, sometimes the value of what you do is by discovering things you don't know by learning new things you need to take into account. Uh, for example, just having another ventilator doesn't mean people know how to use it, doesn't mean that you can, uh, that the clinical protocols are in place, that the patient monitoring is in place, that all of the other support resources from PPE to medications is in place. Uh, the challenges of COVID-19 patients, the typical ventilator patient is on for a few days, maybe a week, non-COVID-19. COVID-19 patients, many of them are on for three weeks and not getting better and not likely to get off better. So there are ethical considerations. But I try to think, how, you know, how can I take all of that kind of stuff that I'm touching on in, in my work and make it relevant to the people on this video um, webinar, HTM people, for whom I have tremendous respect. Uh, and I'm picking up things like, for example, suppose we could get a lot of ventilators and set up some kind of semi-functional ICU areas in the hospital or in the, you know, the hockey arena that's outside of, of my hometown here, wherever. Um, do you have enough medical air and oxygen for it? I know our colleagues in ASHI, American Society for Healthcare Engineering, doing a lot of work uh, trying to address questions like that. It could be that in some sense you've got enough, let's just say oxygen, but the distribution systems vary and you might not have the piping going where it is. And if you load it down, maybe two or three times as much oxygen demand, are you going to have so much flow that the pressure level at the oxygen outlets drops below the level that a ventilator can work. There's so many things that are, are interactive. And I think the message I'm learning and I would uh, share with you is uh, find opportunities to collaborate with others, whether it's your infection control practitioners, your facility management people who are wrestling with ventilation rates and filtration and oxygen and medical mm -hmm. air supplies. Uh, anybody that we, we, we've got to talk, 
we have to talk to each other like we're doing today and we have to talk with our colleagues and see you know where can we make a difference today thank you and my other question is um how concerned are you about a medical equipment shortage we keep hearing so much about it and again i know you've been touching on the ventilators but how concerned are you both so at, at our hospital in North Texas, we are um, working every angle to have as, as much as we need when we hit our surge. Originally, the surge date for North Texas, Dallas area was predicted to be April 30th. They have since squeezed that in a little bit by 12 days, and our surge is predicted to be April 18th. So we are, um, at least in the, in the VA, we were able to identify uh, you know, a few weeks ago that we wanted to perform the preventive maintenance on any ventilators that were due up to up to 90 days away. So um, we started, uh, oh gosh, it, it must it must be oh, over a month now, um, PMing everything that was due up to May. So all of our intensive care ventilators at our hospital, um, you know, that, that we found, we've been able to PM them and have them ready for service. So um, we also identified some of our emergency stockpile of ventilators, which was just owned by our emergency management department. And we have been working to bring those up to speed as well. Um, this was kind of a hidden cache that Biomed hadn't been involved in very much previously. So we, um, we didn't know about it. So they actually do require quite a bit of, of maintenance. They weren't plugged in and charging and, and weren't seen every year because they were just off the radar. So um, I think that's, for us, that's been a very good thing to identify that as a vulnerability for the future. And for now, we're quickly making up for lost time. And once we get our, our parts in, we'll be able to, to manage those and add them to our uh, available pile of, of ventilators. We've also um, ordered additional uh, did that a few weeks ago as well, so that we're we're prepared when those come in that we'll be able to use them. And we have, um, I think, done done a good job coordinating and communicating. I think that we'll have a bigger stake in our emergency management committee um, now that it's it's more recognized that okay, we need to have someone who's a biomedical you know equipment expert on the on the committee and and or just as you know, a, a member with a voice. And I think previously to that, it kind of had not been done before. So it's kind of one of those things you get into the the rut of, oh, it's always been done this way, you know, and, and professionals who have been here previously um, maybe didn't, uh, like, like they were focused on other things that were very important at that time. And so now here's just an opportunity to, again, you know, be prepared. So it's really important, I think, to make sure that you don't wait for a pandemic to happen. You go out and you you reach out to those resources at your institutions or your organizations, and you start that conversation. You introduce yourself and say, hey, if you ever have a question on equipment, please reach out to me if you have a question on medical equipment. And I think that's really what we're trying to be is the technology you know, consultant as well as, as manager. And um, as far as shortages, I know at least in my own organization, we are reaching out to help each other out, whether it's getting on a distribution group nationally and asking for any spare parts if they're on back order and they're needed now at a particular hospital. Um, we, we've also had in our region hospitals reach out and request additional ventilators. We actually sent five ventilators over to New Orleans um, a week or a week and a half or so ago. And it's basically just a matter of, of sharing what we have and being being available to those who are harder hit. So right now, since our peak isn't predicted until you know a week and a half from now, you know two weeks ago that wasn't. Um, two weeks ago we, you know, could could offer those five ventilators over to New Orleans, which had many many more cases than Dallas did. So we're basically just allowing um, or helping out our our fellows and. The VA is a really, it's a very large organization and our, we, have, we have three main missions. And the, that fourth mission that we have is to also provide um, assistance to other private organizations and actually take on additional patients that are non-veterans -vet if, um, if the need arises. So that actually has been activated in some states for the VAs to provide additional overflow for private institutions. So it's really, um, I, I guess really good that we're activating those kinds of things. Um, but I, I think overall there's a sense of 
camaraderie and working together where we're sharing and we're, we're sending equipment where it needs to be. We're sending supplies where they need to be. I mean, even earlier today, they wanted a different, well, an additional level of precaution to put pick, pick lines in COVID-19 positive patients. And they had come down asking for uh, eye shields or eye goggles. And I, I remember I asked him, you know, are, aren't y'all wearing face shields? And they said, oh, yes, we are, but we want that second layer of protection. So we actually dug out some some glasses that weren't goggles so that they wouldn't fog up as much and just handed them right over. There wasn't any kind of question about, um, you know, well, these are ours. We better save them for ourselves because we knew where the greatest need was and we, you know, rose to meet that need as best we could. So um, we were able to provide them with the, the eye shields. And I, I do think that this, this kind of is an opportunity for us to really, um, I guess, really branch out and, and be that, that technology consultant and that, uh, that willing and able, helpful hand to connect people with, with technology and make sure sure that things are, are up and running. And I mean, for, for our shop as well, we've been uh, in constant discussion on, okay, well, once we get that what first piece of medical equipment that's broken, that was used on a COVID-19 patient, where are we going to clean it? Is it going to even come into the shop? Are we going to have a secondary location? And that's what we're actually working on right now is making sure we have a secondary location to put the equipment while it's being cleaned and serviced. So we don't have any cross-contamination by bringing dirty equipment into the shop. Uh, you know, even if it's unknown, you know, we thought it was wiped down, but it wasn't quite so there, we're in constant discussion about that. We have um, almost daily meetings with updates and our, our hospital leadership is actually sending out daily updates to us, keeping us very well informed. So we're, we're very fortunate that we have such a, a good leadership group that is you know, working very hard to make sure that we have the latest and greatest information. Yeah, I, I think that kind of The audio is not working great. Yeah. Sorry. There you go. <laughs> I wanted to say, I mean, that that kind of cooperation is is essential, and it's it's a very hopeful sign that people are finding ways to work together in places with ventilator more than they need, or just sending them across the country to where they're needed, and all, and sharing of information. I think that going forward from this, we're all we're going to learn what worked and what didn't work and maybe institutionalize that and have some, you know, be mm -hmm. not have to invent these unofficial communication links and just have them sort of uh, always in place uh, for, for future problems. There will always be something else coming, coming along. My question is too, so long-term, I mean, how, I, I know it's hard to project, but how do you think this is going to affect operations in HGM? You know, obviously, I don't think anyone was pre fully prepared for a pandemic, but but hopefully, on the other side, what do you think it will teach us? Well, I think from the the hospital Caroline perspective, it's going to teach us that um, some work definitely could be done remotely and uh, maybe support a little bit more or of, um, you know, cutting down on commutes or any, um, you know, contributing to traffic or whatnot, um, just on a, a very surface basic level. I think for my hospital as well, it'll, it's helped us shore up our security, um, being able to lock down all of the entrances, except for a very few and having people be screened. I think that's kind of shown a light on, wow, you know, we never knew there were this many, you know, backdoor little, little ways in. So, I think overall that's going to be a very good benefit for our hospital to be have well excuse me to to be more secure and to have a, a greater lockdown on on how patients are coming in and yeah. besides that I think it it really has shown a light that you know biomed needs to have contingency plans as well and at uh, at the beginning of all these discussions which my hospital was having those those talks in in January and February 
we said, well, you know, this is really no different than working with like a tuberculosis positive patient. You know, you've got someone who's going to go into isolation, they've got an infectious disease. And if we are working on equipment that's been seen by a tuberculosis or that's been used by a tuberculosis patient, we need to make sure that it's been wiped down and cleaned prior to, to us being um, in there to service it or bringing it down to the biomed shop to be serviced. So for, for us, it People were, you know, were talking about it and getting, you know, really excited before, I guess, before it really took off and all the stay-at-home shelter-in-place orders came out. And uh, I was really um, leaning on some of my technicians who have, you know, 30 plus years experience in the field, 40 years experience in the field, and how calm they were, which I really appreciated, because they just said, you know, we work in a hospital, this is our daily working environment. So for us, you know, there might be some change on the outside, but this this is still a hospital. This is still what we're working on. So it's it's business as usual with a heightened sense of awareness. Um, and I, I think that it'll also highlight, um, well, I'm hoping it'll highlight to, to many young folks because I've seen you know some of the articles that have come out of MIT and some of the uh, ambu bag squeezers that they're working on. And um, it's I, I, I'm hoping that this, also provides an opportunity for HTM to be be seen as a very viable and exciting field to be a part of because servicing medical equipment and keeping it up and operational, you may not think about it. And in fact, it's it's HTM is kind of a best kept secret in the engineering world. And this kind of gives us an opportunity to be front and center, um, working and striving to bring um, you know better healthcare and uh, you know, more opportunities to receive healthcare to patients. So I, I think that's that's a really good thing. And I think a lot of biomed shops are gonna have, um, you know, continu continuity of operations plans um, that are much more robust. And because we've we've been here, we've been trying them out. And I've, I've worked in California, I've worked in Texas and our continuity of operations plans are kind of similar to the natural disasters that generally affect the area. So for Texas, we've got, um, we've got tornadoes, we've got uh, floods in California. The main thing was earthquakes, mudslides, wildfires. And so it was kind of interesting to see some of the differences that the emergency management group groups would take in directing people's plans. And, you know, here's an op opportunity to when this is all over, kind of collate all the notes, take the take the data and say, all right, well, in this situation, you know, is it better to have, you know, a separate place to wipe down equipment? Is it better to have a, like an infection control barrier at the front of the shop where you only leave the equipment at the front of the shop um, and maybe tailor those types of solutions to your own in institution, your organization to, you know, so for what best fits you for, um, some places, if they have enough space to make an anteroom in the shop, that might be a very viable option, um, especially if they're, they want to make sure that they're, well, if they want to doubly make sure that their equipment is very clean before they set hand on it. Right. And Matt, what do you think? No, I, I think you said it very well, Clarice. I, I mean, I, I, one of the themes I picked up in what you were saying is moving beyond, you know, we're a shop in a basement fixing stuff to technology management. And we, we certainly do have the, the knowledge to do that. There are some of us in the field who, you know, would are comfortable staying at the bench and saying, letting our work speak for itself. But um, I don't know, it, it, we, we probably need to do more thinking outside the basement, if you will, and talk about how um, it, since technology, is such a fundamental part of any kind of healthcare delivery and has been for a long time. Uh, there's still plenty of places around the country where technical expertise is not at the table for uh, selecting equipment or evaluating incidents that occur or planning for, for emergency operations. So uh, this may be one more opportunity to for us to uh, get a seat at the table for all of us, all of HTM to get a seat at these various tables. There was a time when uh, when I would talk about that, I would say, well, you know, 
find an opportunity to be valuable to the organization and you will be valued and people will call you invite you to the next to the next meeting and uh, to participate but i'm in, i have had um my consciousness raised by people like my good friend carol davis smith who says don't wait for the invitation show up at the meeting they're not going to throw you out uh get in there and 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 show that you've got something that uh, to contribute. Thank you. I mean, I for me personally, this was very eye-opening and I know the people listening will also think that. So thank you so much, Matt and Clarice. And as always, for those listening, if you have any questions or comments, please email me at casestevens at medcore.com. Thank you. And thank you, Matt and Clarice. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.